All right. Revelation, book of Revelation. Verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. All right, well, <clears throat> the most obvious thing and the most uh, common thing that would be quoted on in this first verse by people who teach what we teach <clears throat> would be that this book is not about the revelation of end time events but this is the revelation of Jesus Christ that's the first five words has anybody here ever heard of the revelation of Jesus Christ <laughs> uh, yeah and it didn't have anything to do with end times as prophetically taught by most people <clears throat> um, this book is about revealing Christ and we're going to see some things um, pretty fairly quickly that will help us to see that however <clears throat> um, my approach on this book is what I believe the Lord has shared with me and it is uh, going to be an uncommon approach but uh, and it's going to take me a while to develop the concept but once we get rolling folks once we get rolling in this class you are going to love this stuff I mean it it is so good and it is so full of life and that sounds funny talking about the book of Revelation but it is so full of life and truth and reality reality not just teaching um, and I can say that the book of Revelation also was not written to be some sort of <clears throat> um, uh, theological, um, so, some sort of weird far out angle to theologically talk about the cross and being dead with Christ and that sort of stuff. This is much more than that, much more than that. And who is that really cute girl with the pink flower in her hair? Look how cute she is. That's my granddaughter. <clears throat> All right, so um, it is, uh, I'm going to start by sort of talking a little bit, maybe this first class about <clears throat> some things that we're familiar with or that we that are in the realm of the way we normally teach Christ and him crucified that this first class will not be um, uh, really characteristic of where I'm going or what we're going to be talking about the second class and and you know this depends on how far we get so <clears throat> May, that the second class may be the fifth class by the time we get through but at a certain juncture we're gonna we're gonna hit a stride here and when we hit that stride it is going uh, after once I've laid some things out it's going to be easy sailing through this book because you're going to see what this book really is all about why it was written why it was written is one of the most important factors in this whole thing why was this book written? And once we find that out, and then we begin to see where the Lord has taken us, you're, many of you, you're going to just love the book of Revelation. You're going to love it. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, you, you know that the word revelation means unveiling. That's the actual Greek word, an unveiling or um, uh, getting into the Holy of Holies because there was a veil that kept you out. So the unveiling is not taking you into monsters and horrible events. <laughs> the unveiling is taking you into Jesus Christ. The, if, if you translate that word revelation unveiling, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. But to fully comprehend him 
you're going to have to see it through some circumstances and through some things that the book of Revelation sets up. <clears throat> um, so the revelation of Jesus Christ, and, I'm, and what I'm going to do is I'm also going to skip a certain amount of theological stuff to, um, though this first class is going to be sort of like other classes, like I said, the rest of it won't be. <clears throat> But the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants, things must, which must shortly come to pass. Now, when I was considering that, um, the Holy Spirit reminded me of how many times in the New Testament and in the Gospels, it says, Jesus did so and so, and, and it came to pass that... And what that was talking about was, say, for example, in the Gospels or something, it's talking about a prophetic, a prophecy or a prophetic utterance that was in the Old Testament. And it said, you know, da 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 da. Well, all of a sudden Jesus shows up and he's the fulfillment of that prophetic utterance. When Jesus shows up, it comes to pass. It was just, you're just talking about it before. And everybody can talk about stuff. And everybody can, can talk about scriptures. And everybody can talk about the Christian life. And everyone can talk about the fruit of the Spirit. But the truth is, only Christ is going to be the fulfillment of all of those things. And they're only going to come to pass. I, I know that most of us think when it says that right here, the things which shall shortly come to pass we think that that's talking about the end time and the bad stuff and all of this stuff but that's not what this is talking about what he's talking about is what jesus will be the fulfillment of has been the fulfillment will be the fulfiller of and will continue to fulfill that through his body <clears throat> and so um uh it's the end of prophecy when christ shows up it's the end of talk it's the end of theology, you know. And folks, I want you to think about that for a minute. When Jesus showed up, when Jesus began to walk this earth, he didn't, you know, he didn't primarily go deal with the bad people. He didn't go deal with the, the prostitutes and the sinners and the, all the people that were having those kind of problems. He dealt with the religious people. And the, th the thing that when he comes, when he comes, it comes to pass. And that does away with all of, and what's interesting is when he shows up, he primarily does away with religion. He primarily does away <clears throat> with uh, theology, and he just becomes the son of God. He just become the word theology is from the word theo, which is God, the study of God. No more the study of God. It's just oneness with the Lord. Then you begin to understand the reality of what he's talking about by life and by oneness, by a, by a branch partaking of <clears throat> what somebody saw was true. They saw it prophetically, probably didn't see it by revelation, but prophetically saw certain aspects that were true in the sun, in the vine. And you can sit there and describe, you know, that's being like a scientist. You can describe the, the sap that is in a vine and what it does and, and the effect that it has. And when it's flowing, it, it, it brings forth fruit and it's a wonderful thing. Well, that's a great thing to talk about. But folks, <clears throat> you can talk about that forever. There has to come a time where it comes to pass what was meant by all of that. And it comes to pass when Jesus finally shows up. And that's not just talking about 2,000 years ago. That's talking about when he shows up in our life, when he begins to be revealed, then we begin to see what is, I was, I'm trying to say it like this, then we begin to see what is true already in us if you're born again. This is already true of you, but it's not truly fully in reality working in you. So what we do is we look at the prophecies and we try to fulfill them instead of looking at Jesus and letting him fulfill them. We look at the scriptures and we try to fulfill them instead of looking at him and letting him fulfill them. Instead of realizing that he is the vine, we are the branch, 
There's nothing written in those scriptures that we can fulfill. Only Christ can fulfill them, and he is the fulfillment of all of those things. <clears throat> and so that, that just narrows down your search. You know, uh, it, it takes a Bible school that had 5,000 courses, and it makes, makes it a study for one person to know him, not, not to study the facts of him but to know him in such a way that we are joined to him, we're conformed to him, that it's his life. Paul said it best. It's not I. Christ lives in me. He didn't say I'm living for Christ. I'm, I'm, I'm spreading the gospel. I'm evangelizing. I'm being a missionary. I'm going to other countries. I'm, I'm busy for God. He said, I'm dead. I'm crucified. I'm not busy. Are you busy? No. I'm dead. Um, Paul also described it several different ways, like talking about it as the grace of God relating to the life of Christ. And he said, you know, that it's the grace of God working in me, and then he, he changes that. And he says, well, but it's really the God of grace. It's his spirit. It's his life. <clears throat> All right. So these are the things that will come to pass, but they'll, they're only going to come to pass. Uh, let, me, let me just give you an early warning system. They're only going to come to pass until you've been in some situations where it requires it. Right now, many of our, our situations do not require to be Christ. Some do. Some do. But many of our situations, but the book of Revelation begins to set the stage for circumstances that will usher in life for those who are prepared to to stand with it. Now, when I say that, I'm not talking prophetically. I'm talking spiritually. I'm talking, I'm not talking about end time events happening so bad that you'll finally get it. Okay, I'm talking about, again, the purpose, I haven't stated it yet, the purpose for which this book was written. And what Jesus, because Jesus is the one who wrote, as it were, wrote these letters to the seven churches that it begins with and then spreads throughout the rest of the book. <clears throat> All right. So you, you, we see that in uh, verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Let's just stop right there. He's identified who this letter or these letters are to, but ultimately the book of Revelation. Who, it is, who is it to? Who is it written to? Well, here it says to the seven churches, and then he says, grace be unto you and peace from him who is and was and who is to come. At this point, he doesn't say it, he doesn't say grace and peace be to you through Jesus. He talks about him who was a long time ago, who is, and who is to come. He talks about the only constant in the universe. He talks about the only um, he, he, in that sense, he says, I'm not even going to describe it to you with a name because you'll put religion on that name. All of a sudden, what is eternal from beginning to end, what is, what is here and was here and will be here, if we call it a name that you're familiar with, you are going to, all of a sudden, I don't know, I don't know how to explain it, go into some sort of religious mode and say, yes, it's, it's talking about Jesus. And when you say Jesus, your 
concepts, your, in some cases, your religious concepts of Jesus is what's going to come to mind, and you will end everything beyond what you already know. So that means that the boundaries of your universe are confined by the information that you have, which I just want to tell you, it's not even a solar system, okay? <laughs> It is, it is held back by what you know of God instead of him who is and was and is to come. Now, how do, you, how do you even expand to that? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to start in your being, you have to start renouncing religion and saying, God, show me the Jesus that was your son who was and is and is to come. Show me that Jesus. And the, and the Father and the Holy Spirit are the only one who'll do that. And, I, and, you know, sure, you've heard that before on some level. But there, there does come places in our life where our heart is more attuned, where, we, where we're, I don't know how to put it, where we mean it a little more, maybe a lot more, because we, we really are either sick of the religious Jesus that we know or we are in straits in such a manner that we are desperate for the Lord and for those who aren't there they just fall on hard grounds like like casting seed a sower went forth and sowed and he sowed some seed on concrete and it just laid there you know <clears throat> Um, the purpose for writing this letter and the purpose of God and the purpose of having classes like this is so that something it doesn't have to be the whole class it doesn't have to be everything but something goes forth that has an eternal impact and that says oh Lord it, it begins to cause your heart to open and to say, Lord, I do want you. And, and let me just say this. When I was in Bible school, <clears throat> the first couple of months I was there, stuff would hit me from the Lord in some of the classes, you know. And it would hit me and I'd go, okay, well, I need to wait on that. And after class, I will, you know, ask the Lord to, you know, bring that home to me. And I remember after class trying to remember what it was and how it was and how did that go? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, you know, and you just like, uh, gosh, I was so sincere and it was really good. But, you know, and I said, you know what, from now on, when something hits me, I'm going to pray right then and there. I'm going to pray right then and there. Um, and I'm going to say, Lord. You know, if something's coming after that you want me to hear, then get it in me somehow. But I'm, I'm asking you this thing that you're saying right now. Please move me out of the realm of my comfort or my, my, at least my comfort in my knowledge that I know. And say, him that was and is and is to come, that's just, that's just vast. <laughs> you know, that is so vast. Um, and yet... You know, we have, we have, you know, that's, and, and let me just say this too. That's not to say we don't have stuff from the Lord. That's not to say we don't have the Lord. We do have the Lord. The point of that is not to condemn us. The point of that is to move us in heart first beyond what we already do have and say, Lord, there's more of you. Open my eyes, open my heart. And, and. And let me, uh, let me come to you on the water. Well, that's impossible to walk on the water. Well, that's impossible. But if you, if you want to get to the Lord, he'll grant it. He'll grant the impossible. But if you just want to walk on water to show off, you can forget it, you're going to drown. Because, <laughs> you know, Peter's words, can I come to you on the water? What was Jesus' words? One word? Come. That's right. Jesus, that, that signifies 
Jesus' heart to have us come to him. That's what it signifies. And when Peter heard that, then he started what? Walking on water? No. He started coming to the Lord. All right. So what, what I'm saying by that is there are impossibilities in front of you and around you. There are, you, you've, you, you know, I don't know what the impossibilities are. They can be anything from you've got problems and you'll never, I'll, you know, I'll never, you know, and I'll never get in the right place or, you know, um, uh, God's dealt with me before and, you know, it didn't last very long. You're going to have to look, you know, you're going to have to, you know, it's good to believe in Christ as your life. But, you know, that same Jesus is a God of miracles. Amen. You know, the same Jesus. And he really likes working them when people want to come to him. Because that then, that temporal healing or miracle has eternal ramifications instead of just fixing something that's going to get old and whatever. You know what I mean? Anyway. So, so the goal isn't to come to Jesus for miracles even. Does he do them? Yes. Can we believe? Yes. Must we believe if we're in a situation where we're hard and we're dry? You, you know, you can still believe. You can still cry out. You can still say, Lord, I want to come to you on the impossible. In my impossible situation or in my impossible me, I'm impossible. <laughs> yeah. But what did he say? Sure, with man, that's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Okay. So it has to quicken your faith. It has to quicken your heart. It has to quicken your love for Jesus. It has to quicken your desire to go after him. And then it has to quicken your, your, your faith to say, he can, he can uh, precipitate this. He can make a way for me to get to him. So I'm going to believe that without any sign or feeling, I'm going to believe that I, even if you don't even know what the impossibilities are, I'm going to believe that right now and believe that he's going to bring me more to him, more to the eternal Jesus. And that's, that's important wording there, that he's going to bring me more to the eternal Jesus. Okay. Amen. All right, um, let's look at uh, verse 8. <clears throat> I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Does that sound anything like what we've been talking about? <clears throat> You're... He's the Almighty to be able to bring you to Him who is and was and is to come. The same one that you want to get to also is the one who makes the way. The same one that you want to get to who was and is and is to come and is eternal is also the Almighty who can, if you'll, you know, you, you don't have to be you know, some people think, well, you know, you got to be crying to really be soft. No. You know what? I, I proved that years ago. The Lord dealt with me and he said, just go down there. Even if you don't feel anything, go down to that altar right now and in faith say, I believe, I received this. And, you know, some of you have heard, but, you know, it's like, you know, I said, Lord, I'm asking you right now. And then I took it in my spirit. I received it. I didn't go, oh, give it to me, please, you know, and wait for him to shove it down my throat. You know, I took it. I took what he offered. And I believed that that was, you know, that, that whoever was sharing the word, that was just a mouthpiece. That was just a servant. That was a messenger of him who was calling my heart out of the old places and into something brand new with him. The, he's the Alpha and the Omega, and you know, that's the Greek alphabet, that in our alphabet it would be, I'm the A to Z. You know? 
I'm the one who was and who is and who is, who was and is and who is to come. But this time tacked on the back of it is the Almighty. Yes, Lord. That's where you, you say, yes, Lord. You understand that? That's where your heart bows to the Almighty and you say, yes, Lord. You, you can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that I could ever ask or think. Instead of just going, well, I'm waiting on you to do it. He's waiting on you to, to, believe, to, to come to the Almighty to get to the eternal. Yeah. I don't know who woo, but I, I believe that's right. <laughs> I take it back. I do know who woo. <clears throat> okay. Here he calls himself the beginning and the ending. Other places in the book of Revelation, he calls himself the beginning and the end. What's the difference? Well, the ending, the ending, how it's all wrapped up is tied with the beginning. The end is also tied. The end I won't get into that right now, <clears throat> but it's also tied to him. Um, and then, uh, let's see, verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not. Okay. It gets better than that. But the Lord right now is on this theme for someone or several someones here or maybe all of us that um, when John catches an eternal glimpse, not a teaching glimpse of Jesus. I mean, I, I appreciate teaching as much as anyone. I do a lot of it. But I don't believe one iota of my teaching can change anybody. <laughs> you know, only the Holy Spirit can do that and bring someone into that. And so he, 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 he caught a glimpse of the eternal. And he caught it by seeing him. Not a, not a vision. Not a manifestation, but by what? The revelation of Jesus Christ. It's already it's spelled that out to us. The unveiling of Jesus. And there, John looks and he sees him. And the immediate effect on John is that he falls down as dead. All right. Now, folks, that is not your normal thought that most people think is going to happen to you when you see Jesus. A lot of people, even among those of us who teach this, think that when you see Jesus, you're going to become like a superhero. <laughs> you're going to have superpowers. You're going to be able to walk through fire and go through all this stuff, and you're going to be better than Spider-Man. Certainly better than Batman, since all he had was gadgets and no superpowers. Sorry, on that one, i got to take a drink. Superman. <clears throat> but it's not true. It's not true. To get to where you want to go, you have to go through the cross. You have to go through the death. You have to. You have to, you have to. Uh, I'm going to be teaching in a conference down in Houston <clears throat> next, this week, end of this week, next weekend. Y'all keep praying for me, would you? I appreciate every ounce of prayer, and I mean it with all my heart. <clears throat> um, uh, and the Lord told me I need to share on John 12, 24 with them. And he said, start with accept. 
except the corner where he'd fall into the ground and die. It abideth alone, except, unless, unless it happens. And if it doesn't happen, then the other part isn't going to happen. This, it's the same word, except a man be born again. You cannot see the kingdom. Lord, I want to see the kingdom of God. You must be born again. Except you be born again. Well, same thing here. And that death, folks, <clears throat> that death, I'm, I'm just going to tell you right now, it's not like you think, nor is the resurrection like what you think. It'll surprise you. It is not as you suppose. <clears throat> Why? Because the death, okay, listen to this. Because the death as you suppose it is based on a carnal mind. Because you haven't seen that death yet. Does that make sense? Can I get amen on that one? That, so all we can do is conceive in our own minds what we think it is. And we take what this person said and that person said and this person said. Well again, that's theology or the study, we're studying we're studying fragments of teaching and calling it God. We, we receive this fragment. And we add that to our little, we've got a little parcel bag here that we put our little fragments in. And, and pretty soon, what we conceive to be God is what we have of our fragments that's in our little bag. That's God. No, no, no. All of that wasn't what anyone has said. It has been the carnal mind, your carnal mind, my carnal mind's um, best effort at comprehending something that's incomprehensible by the carnal mind. <laughs> well, we are pessimists, many of us. So the picture that we have of that death is not, it's not good. Well, this is not good. I need to get, I need to get back to that prosperity church. Because <laughs> uh, this isn't going to be good. And then people start applying that stuff to themselves, trying to act like they're dead, which is ridiculous. Okay, I'm dead. And then, you know, you walk by a store window and there's something hanging up there on mannequin. You go, oh, I really want, you know what I mean? It's like, how dead are you? <laughs> Not too dead, I want that. <laughs> you know, something, something comes up and we go, well, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead. I reckon I'm dead. Well, I reckon you are too, but that's not it. That's not the right reckoning. You know, <clears throat> it is um, to, to see it while you're in it, that's knowing the death, <laughs> you know? All right, so John sees Jesus and he's dead. Falls at his feet, he's dead. You know? Now, we read that, other churches read that, and they go, yeah, praise God. They don't, they don't flinch an inch. That doesn't bother, they read right over that. But if you preach to them, not through here, but if you just say to them, well, when you see Jesus, it's going to kill you. <laughs> then they want to kill you. <laughs> but isn't it interesting that right there, it basically, that's it. He's wanting to, he's so far he's got a message from God, now he's seeing God. The message didn't kill him, the seeing of him did, but with purpose for life, for new life. Okay, you got that? I mean, I'm, I'm just saying, it's not about um, an end, it's about a beginning and then an end, and then a beginning, with an end and a beginning. Many things to say, but I need to hold off. <clears throat> um, and then verse 17, here he goes on to say, uh, well, let's, let's make sure that we got, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his hand upon me, saying, fear not. 
All right. There's a clue right there that your comprehension of death has been based on a carnal mind because you've been fearing the moment. <laughs> See? Why would he have to say fear not? Because we have our own conceptions of what's going on. And we conceive bad stuff in our minds. Did you know that? Particularly this section right over, <laughs> right over there, sort of over on that side over there, <laughs> like over, like right there. <laughs> we do. We conceive just crazy things, you know. For example, our explanation of the Book of Revelation. Instead of seeing Jesus out of it, it to he okay, John dies, that's the worst thing that could possibly be happen, but Jesus says, Fear not, lays his hand on him and raises him back up. Okay? This is a microcosm of reality as God understands it. And he's saying, Why are you fearing? Or fear not, don't fear. You know, why are you fearing? Well, it's the same as don't fear, or let's reverse the wording and say, Fear not, not fear. Not fear. <laughs> You know, don't fear. Don't fear verse 17 or verse 18 or verse 19 or chapter 2 or chapter 5 or chapter 16 or chapter 22. Don't fear. You're with me in something that's eternal and you're going to be okay, but you need to enter into the one who was and is and is to come. You need to, to embrace something beyond yourself or you're just floating in the universe like a particle of dust. Yes. y'all can pick up with that but Nisi uh, just shared and uh, and I'll just say you know the best teacher I've ever heard on the book of Revelation is sitting right over there Nisi's sharing of the Lord and what the Lord has opened her up to is is some of the best stuff that I've ever heard in the book of Revelation um, I thought I would feel a little um, funny I did I thought I'd feel a little funny teaching in front of her but then when the Lord just started really running with this oh my god i can't wait till we get till we start running with it oh gosh i'm i'm, I'm not joking y'all know i don't do this over stuff this stuff is just flat good it's just god good <clears throat> amen well nisi was was saying that you know he's the alpha and the omega the first and the last, and Alpha and Omega is the full letters of the alphabet. So anything you could say, think, or whatever, um, or come come up with is all uh, Him, and therefore go into our own carnal mind is ridiculous. Um, in fact, you know the Bible never says, "Let this mind be taught into you." He says, let this mind be in you. And he doesn't say work it in you. He uses the word let, which is a submissive word, not an active, hard-working word. Let. You know, it's like, okay, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let. You know, yeah, show me. You know, we get all this panicked, freaked out stuff. Don't be freaked out. Or, can I say it a different way? Uh, instead of don't be freaked out, fear not. <laughs> fear not. Who's he talking to? One who just died because he looked at Jesus. Yeah. See, he's not saying fear not to people who are carnally just living their life. He's saying that to those who are coming into something that is of the nature of God. It is not 
teaching, it is of the nature of God. And for you to grasp it will require not a mind, but a spirit. Because it's not, you know, I worked for Denton State School for years, and a lot of those kids didn't have a mind that would work good, well. Neither do I. And, and they could still receive the Lord because they had a spirit. Yeah, you know, we limit everything. And if we're all caught up in just Bible school knowledge instead of a heart for Jesus or, 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 or going to church and gaining knowledge just instead of being there for Jesus, man, I mean, I remember I turned at a certain juncture and every church service, every time I, anybody preached, I didn't care who it was, you know, uh, at first in my early days it was like, oh, no, not that person again. I never get anything out of what they say. Oh, God, please, you know. Um, <clears throat> But then I learned the Holy Spirit was there for each and every gathering. And if I would open up and say, Lord, I want something, anything from you, he would show me something, you know. And, you know, but we're, we're so earthly and we're so prejudiced and we're so, you know, we want things a certain way instead of saying, Lord, I want it your way, you know, I guess. Too much Burger King, you know, have it, have it your way, you know. Well, no, don't. <laughs> have it his way. Begin to say, because we don't, you know, he is the way, right? So he's not going to show us his way. He's going to show us himself. That's going to be the revelation of Christ, just like this, just like over here in, you know, Luke, just like anywhere else. It's always going, if, if we're going to get past the surface, if we're going to get past the outer court, if we're going to enter in through the veil, there has to be an unveiling. And that unveiling, you know, I mean... I remember also, you know, for years since I've taught the revelation of Christ, I've heard people say stuff like, oh, I want to get a revelation. And go, you want to get an unveiling of what? You just want to get an unveiling. You know, I want to get a revelation. No, you don't. You want to see Jesus. You want God to unveil Christ. You don't want to get a revelation. Well, you know, we teach getting a revelation. No, we don't. Hush, I don't even want to hear that. It hurts my ears to hear stuff like that. You know? No. I want Jesus. Do you want Jesus? Well, yeah. Go oh, and get me one of them revelations. <laughs> God, no, 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 no. What a sad thing to spend years seeking the Lord, but it's not really seeking the Lord. It's seeking something that we think is big, a revelation, but not really having the Lord as our goal. Lord, I want you. Lord, motivate me, change me, do something in me, be the Almighty and do a miracle and get me to you. But I want you, and I'm looking to you, and I'm, I'm, it's impossible in my state and in my condition and in the situation that I'm dealing with, to ever be here unless you do it. But you know what? I believe in you, and I want you, and I'm with you, and I'm going after you. You think he hears that kind of prayer? Yes. Amen. He goes, wow, that's different. Oh, Lord, bless you. Bless my parents and bless my kids and bless my job and bless my finances and bless me as I go to sleep. What is that? Nothing eternal in that. I mean, first of all, the one you word to use over and over is bless, bless me, bless, bless everything around me that's mine. You know. Greg, did you have something? Uh, I had a pastor who used to talk about heaven. Relationship with God, but it 
five right there and if I stop right now then we won't go so long in the second half and people people that got kids uh, yeah that's you know what that's probably fast isn't it all right we'll go a little further then um, okay verse 18 we never finished that uh, verse 17 Jesus said fear not I am the first and the last. I like that I like that you know, have you ever noticed when Jesus talks, it doesn't make sense to us? You know, I mean, he'll, he'll say stuff and you'll go, what kind of answer is that? You know, and it's like, where do I, just, just tell me the answer, you know what I mean? And, and uh, but he, he did give us the answer. And he, he gave the answer right here when, you know, they're dead. And he says, fear not. I am the first and the last. You know, well, our carnal mind will go, well, that's good for you, but I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> right, Mike? <laughs> you know, that's great. That's great. I'm glad you're doing so good. You're the first and you're the last, but I'm down here dead. No, you're not. No, you're not. You're one with Christ. You're one, you are one in his death and you're one in his resurrection. See, you, you can't forget that. You know, you were uh, incorporated in. You were made a partaker. You didn't just die. You were brought into him so that he could take you into death and so he could bring you up in oneness with him. Brand new life. Old things passed away. See, not you, not you again born again not you again not you blessed you dead but not you now resurrected he is the resurrection but you are one with the resurrection life and that's Christ in you the hope of glory that's the hope of glory <clears throat> so then he goes on he says I am he that liveth and, and was dead and again we would go well you're living but I'm dead that's right now you got it. You just nailed it. He is living and you're dead. Now you're starting to comprehend how you're going to fulfill or keep, you would say keep. You never you can't keep this these things. Keep the commandments, keep the you know things that God says. It's not about keeping. It's about them all being fulfilled and you can only fulfill them by his life. His life. His life fulfills all things. We already covered that. His life fulfills all of that. So it's important for you to embrace his words. I am he that liveth and was dead. You're dead and I am he that liveth. But then he goes on and says I am um, he that liveth and was dead and I want to just tell you that that's an incredible statement. I can't tell you why right now. But for Jesus to turn to John at this moment in time. See, I don't have a, here's my pen. I didn't mark it in this Bible. I had it marked in another Bible. I'm going to mark that and hope that the Lord reminds me to come back here and because this statement really is a major cog in the book of Revelation. Major, 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 major. It's, it's just going to breathe life when you see what he's saying to him. Verse 18, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Well, you didn't know Jesus said amen, did you? 
but it wasn't over food. It was over reality. It was over reality. Eternal reality has just been spoken to a carnal dead stump. Carnal mustard. Sorry about that. <laughs> Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. <clears throat> All right. Um, let's see here. Okay, I will say this. He's saying that he's, he just said in, in the end of verse 17, this is all one sentence, by the way, I'm the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. I am the first and the... He's not the first and the last outside of the cross or outside of the reality of the cross because there on that cross eternity broke loose in a in a world that just at best had prophets that were talking about him that best had writings that were speaking of him but now they have come to pass now it's come to pass Christ is here and more eternally because it's because he's not just uh, uh, touting the fact that Jesus is was incarnate He's talking about Jesus coming as the fulfillment of it. <clears throat> and it's all tied into this thing of being him that's alive, that lives. I'm he, I'm he that lives. Liveth means ongoing, continually. I'm the guy that lives. But was dead. But was dead. <clears throat> and then chapter 2, uh, we'll come back to some of this in the next class, Lord willing. But chapter 2, verse 8, and the angel, uh, and unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, these things saith the first and the last who was dead and is alive. There it is again. Except he said it in chapter 1 as eternal reality he's saying it in chapter 2 to the churches this is your reality now they don't know it they don't they don't know it yet they don't know this fully they know the Lord they know he saves they know da 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 but they don't know this and that's why one of the reasons why he's writing because there he's going to feed them something in a in a discourse that is going to open their eyes to something that is just it's going to it's going to make them free it's going to make them free and it's going to set them on God's trail it's going to set them on the path of the righteous that is like the light of dawn it gets brighter and brighter until the full day, until the sun's over you and there's no more shadows. Full day is when the high noon, we call it in Texas. <laughs> high noon. When it's right over your head and you can't see your shadow anymore. All you see is what the sun is revealing and what the sun is in himself. All right, so, um, and then, I'll close with uh, chapter 4 and verse, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, chapter 3 and verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Not the beginning of creation. Jesus is the beginning of the creation of God. And that full new creation didn't happen in one day. The first day, this. The second day, this. The third day. <clears throat> All right. We'll take a break. And we'll come back for round two.